I look at the fundamentals and all the reasons why I said that this year I thought would be the year for gold. Like last year, my, my highest conviction trade was uranium. This year it's gold. And all those reasons are just now beginning to play out. Lobo, how are you? Well, I am doing well. Uh, the world, maybe not so much, but uh, here I am in tropical paradise, <laughs> hopefully out of harm's way, shaking my head and seeing if, uh, you know, how, how can I navigate this world best for myself, my family, my, my readers, my clients, anybody I can help. Yeah. Well said, I would agree with you on that. And then this conflict, um, again, it seems to be escalating. It's just, it's just another, and I don't say this, I say this with all due respect it is it's another curveball that we have to navigate, I guess, as far as safety as well as just investing and, um, yeah, who knows what's going to happen. So, um, yeah, if I, if I can just say, I think for our purposes, one, there's the human tragedy. We can take a whole show talking about that. We can't do anything about it. So, and this is a financial oriented show and that's what we talk about. So if we talk about investment implications, it doesn't mean we're heartless profiteers, just, you know, making blood money here. It, it, it you know, I, my finger is on the button is not on the button of any of these missiles falling or tanks going or whatever. So, uh, you know, I can't stop that. What I can do is look at what I can do and, and with myself and my life, my finances and help those around me. In that context, I'm not a geopolitical expert. I'm not a military expert. You know, is there a way this escalation stops without dragging the U.S. in and turning it into World War III? I don't know, is it, but I don't think anybody wants that. So I'm not betting on it. What I do know is that things have not looked this scary for quite some time. And in that world, there is demand for safe haven assets. So. Yeah. It's not surprising to see gold up on a day like today as you and I record. And, you know, that, that's significant. So can I tell you what's going to happen? No. Can I tell you that I sleep better knowing that I have bullion physically, you know, in my control, third palm tree on the left on the beach, you know, the midnight gardening? <laughs> um, yes. And I, and I think that's important. I think to days like today remind us for why, you know, they call us gold bugs or tinfoil hat or whatever. But on days like today, it's a good reminder that there's nothing tinfoil hatty or crazy about taking out a bit of insurance or a lot of insurance. Yeah. Very well said. I couldn't have said it better. So thank you. Um, speaking of which, this really relates to the gold, um, the gold move. Uh, as I mentioned off camera, I'm an avid follower of yours on X and, um, you made this before all of this started happening over in the Middle East. I don't want to say before it started happening, before it started happening today, you made a tweet about how you were joking, but not really how you're a little concerned because gold, this gold move is so strong and everybody's starting to talk about gold. Let's visit that. And, um, it is a strong move, but. Do you see this move long in the long in the tooth, or where are you at with that? No, and two ways of looking at this. So the no is no. I don't see it as long in the tooth. I mean, for you know a, a bona fide market wave or cycle, you know, do you get the despondency, you know, ignoring and hope, and then you going up into the mania phase, and then denial, right, all the way back down again. That well known cycle we all know and love to hate. Um, we're nowhere near many phase. And, you know, people like to say, oh, we have echoes of the seventies, trouble in the Middle East, restrictions on oil supply, inflation, looks like stagflation and so on. You know, I remember the seventies. I, I may not look old enough, but I do. And no, I wasn't on wall street managing the seventies then, but as a kid making money, I wasn't a shoeshine boy, but I babysat and I mowed lawns. I did all kinds of things. And I remember that context. And I remember putting my money into silver dollars because I, there was no blockchain to give me fractional gold ownership at the time. Um, 
And I, you know, I remember, so I wasn't the shoeshine boy, but I was the lawnmower boy. And I was talking about gold and silver with anybody who would listen, right? You know, that sort of thing where you went into the bar and the bartender would show you the shiny new gold coin he got or something. That's completely absent this time around. We haven't gone anywhere near that level of participation. And I don't think we did and get anywhere near in 2011 either. So it, does it have to repeat? Do we have to see the same thing? No. But if you're going to say, oh, well, this is, this is a mania. This is a, you know, contrarians should be nervous to the point, you know, like we get nervous when everybody starts getting on board. If you're a contrarian, it's way too soon to say, oh, that's it. CNBC mentioned gold I'm selling. Like if you, if you did that, if you sold every time one of these snarky guys on X or formerly Twitter said, oh, CNBC said something about gold I'm selling, we would have sold at 1500 We would have sold at 1700 We would have sold at 1900 right? Like we would have sold at, you know, we wouldn't have any gold left by now. So, you know, like, nobody should be taking investment advice from snarky guys on Twitter alone. But the, the point is, I think if we're going to have anything like uh, a mania phase or never even my mania phase. If we're going to have any, like a normal market cycle, we're nowhere near the top. Um, as far as, you know, uh, cycles and not a chartist, I don't really look at the wave theory and so on, but, um, you know, I'm a fundamentalist and I look at the fundamentals and all the reasons why I said that this year I thought would be the year for gold. Like last year, my, my highest conviction trade was uranium. This year it's gold. And all those reasons are just now beginning to play out. You know, the, the I was in team hard landing. I was saying the labor market was going to crack. I was saying Fed was going to cut rates. And that was typically bullish for gold when the Fed goes into a rate cutting cycle because gold doesn't pay interest, you know, all these things. You know, well-established trends. And those are starting to happen now as far as I'm concerned. So... The, that's what, remember I said there's two answers. So the one is the fundamentalist in me says, no, all the reasons why I'm bullish on gold, they're still in front of us and just now coming into play. And that's, you know, going into that from twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars $2,700 gold is, uh, you know, I, I don't even want to say where that we might go from there because it sounds like I've, you know, I've got gold bug mania. But the other paw, global means wolves, so I have paws rather than hands, but... Uh, the other part, though, is not just that it's gone up so much, but when you get something that's not a normal market dynamic, or basically an exogenous shock like a geopolitical thing, yeah, you'll see gold go jump in response to that, usually with the dollar, which breaks this idea that they have to be op opposite. You know, you'll see the safe haven demand will make people stampede into gold and the dollar at the same time. This happened last October when Hamas you know, did the horrific thing that it did. And it happened in the second invasion of Ukraine. It happened in the first invasion of Ukraine. It happened briefly in the Gulf Wars. Um, but the thing about that is that it's short-lived. It's it's not just the, the, you know, end of the war brings the world back to normal. Some of these wars never end. It's sort of the end of the news cycle. You know, it's, as soon as something else starts capturing the headlines beyond, gosh, it's, you know, war. Um, then you'll see that start to fade. And here's the thing. This isn't necessarily a bearish argument. Listen to me carefully to your audience. I'm not saying that as soon as the war headlines cool, that gold will go down. I'm saying that in these kinds of things, we always see gold spike when there's a geopolitical event like that. And then it reverts to trend. So if the trend was upwards before, you'll get ahead of it. And then it'll come back down to meet that trend. And it'll continue unless something else changes on the fundamentals. And if the trend is downwards, then it'll spike up and then it'll go lower back down. It'll meet that trend again. So we again, a clear example of this is, as I recall, is the uh, both of the invasions of Ukraine by Russia. And the first one, the trend was down. We got a spike and then it went back down again. The second one, the trend was up. We got a spike and it came back down, but then it continued trending upwards. So in this context, it was trending upwards. We get a big spike on the war scare gets ahead of itself maybe. So some correction and consolidation after one of these spikes is not just normal. I think it's almost de rigueur. I don't have the math to tell you it's 100%, but it feels like that. From my experience, it seems like every time you get a spike on some really scary geopolitical news, it will correct. 
Um, but then it reverts to trend. So I'm not making a bearish case. I am saying that as bullish as I am for everything else I just said, I can see space for gold to correct in the near term, at, you know, as soon as the headline's cool. Yeah, well said. I, I would actually really agree with you on that. And that is not, again, for everybody listening and watching, as you said, that's not a bearish case for gold. It's just, if you get a pullback here, that's entirely normal as well, I, as well I would say is healthy. And in fact, if you do get a pullback, hopefully the things have cooled over and uh, de-escalated over in the Middle East. So as a human being, yes, I would love to see that pullback. I mean, you know, Hezbollah and, and Israel and, and Iran and everybody, you know, everybody takes a step back and says, look, we're, we're too close to World War III. Let's, let's take a breather. Yeah, I would, as a human being, I would love to see that happen. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go back to um, the Fed. The Fed cut 50 basis points. I want to say this was two, I don't know exactly the date. It was mid, mid-September, mid but I do remember it. And I was surprised. Were you quite surprised that they cut a whole um, 50 basis points? Was that surprising to you? Yes and no. I was in, you know... I, I, I try very hard not to make, you know, specific uh, predictions like that. Not just because I hate being wrong, which I do. It's true. I hate being wrong. Um, but because if you tell people, oh, the Fed's going to do this, and then they don't, well, you know, and people make investment decisions based on that, you probably hurt some. So I try very hard to, to say, you know, here's, here's what I think is likely and why and different possible outcomes and so on. But the way I said yes and no is because I've been in team hard landing. So if I was a mainstream economist, I would have been one of those guys saying the Fed should cut 50, the Fed should have cut in July, they should cut more. You know, there's there, there's no way that they're not behind the curve given what we see coming. We, we had, we, people are admitting now that there are cracks in the labor market, that it's weakening. That they're admitting it now means that it started before. And they really started in July. The cracks started appearing in the labor market in July. And the yeah. cracks they're admitting now, there's not new cracks. This is widening of the cracks. You yeah. know, exacerbated by the almost million jobs, those famous 818,000 jobs that just disappeared. And in, in the first revision, by the way, that's not the last revision. We'll see those numbers. Um, so... You know, the, the, the fact that this is starting to happen is becoming obvious to everybody now, um, you know, if, if I was, it, you know, it, it's now, but at the time of the Fed was meeting, they weren't admitting any of this. They were still saying everything's fine. In fact, Powell is still saying everything is fine. Um, so given that it hadn't become as undeniable a trend as I think it is now, I was thinking they'd probably go with 25. Because why spook the markets? And according to what they're saying, you know, they don't need to do anything bigger. So I think that their action actually contradicted what they were saying. They were saying all along, everything's fine. We're on a nice glide path, basically saying, you know, we're going to stick this soft landing without so, you know, saying it in so many words. Um, and in my mind, the, the 50 completely contradicts that. There is, it's, there's no way that those two actions make sense together. I mean, we call that a jumbo cut for a reason. It's a double cut. You, basically, the, you don't do that without some good reason. And if the excuse is, oh, well, you know, we're just normalizing, you know, the, the restrictive is now down, our star, you know, it's now down. Well, if that's true, and you're just trying to get to a, a normal level, non-restrictive level, well, why not go a point? You know, the, the estimate is from well below where we still are. So if everything is so wonderful, we could just cut to our star or our guess of that. Why not just do it all at once? Because, but no. So in, in my view, uh, their actions speak louder than words. Their actions tell me that they saw more trouble than they're admitting. And even now, you know, Powell at NABE yesterday saying everything's fine, everything's fine. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. I suspect that if he isn't flat out lying, then he's had too much of that Kool-Aid and he's too programmed to see it. But I suspect that he, and I, you know, I can't prove, I can't, I'm not a mind reader. I don't want to make uh, bold statements like one presidential candidate who's famous for them. I just want to say that I, I don't see how a fairly intelligent, well-informed human being, as Powell appears to be, could possibly not know 
you know, not see what is so obvious to everybody else that there is trouble out there. So, but his job isn't to tell the truth. His job is to steer the ship of state in, in wherever he thinks it should go. So I think that's what's going on. I think the Fed is just trying to manage expectations and confidence because that's what mainstream economics thinks they should do. And I framed all this in terms of mainstream economics because, you know, if I was a mainstream economist and I believed what Powell believed, the 25 would have made sense. If I was a mainstream economist and I believed what I believed, then 50 or more would have made sense. But I'm not a mainstream economist. I actually think that they should, if, if the Fed has any role with rates at all, they should still be higher for longer. You know, I still think inflation's not dead yet. I think, you know, <laughs> I, you know, the recession won't necessarily create the deflation everybody's expecting, especially if Lynn Alden, I don't know if you've interviewed her and talked about fiscal dominance, but if she's right about all the other money coming from Washington, swamping out the Fed's efforts with monetary policy, then, you know, that is serious concern. You know, both parties are promising a chicken in every pot, the moon, the stars, everything else. It's highly inflationary. So for the Fed to be cutting in front of that, I think is inviting the inflation genie back out of the bottle. Um, so I, I'm not a mainstream economist. If it, if, if it was, if I was in Powell's shoes, I'd quit, but I'd try to pull the plug on, on the Fed before I did. I'd try to abolish the Fed. Audit Fort Knox, all those wonderful things if I had the chance. Uh, but sorry, long-winded answer because it's kind of complicated. But, but the, the takeaways here, the, I think the more important point, if you remember nothing else of what I said about the Fed, is I think the 50 is a tacit admission that not all is well in Mudville. And they know it, and they're trying to get less behind the curve. I don't know that they can get ahead of the curve, but they're trying. they know they're behind the curve, and they're trying to get out from behind it. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. And that, that's, that was a great answer. Um, so thank you. Um, I might ask though, to, I mean, there's this huge, uh, implications to all of this and it's, do you see any, and looking into the future is very tricky, right? Yeah. But do you see this now that we have a massive wave or beginning a massive wave of monetary inflation yet economic? stagnant or deflation now, which is basically the worst of all words world. Yes. It's, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny in the sad way, in the laugh or cry kind of department. How is it, you know, mainstream economists still adhere to models in which stagflation is not possible. Like it literally can't happen. Right. And yet we know that it has. And we, and you can say, oh, well, the seventies was different. Well, not that different. And we're not talking prehistoric times. And, you know, we've seen stagflation in Europe in, you know, very, very recent memory. So to just say, oh, that was something back in, in the 1970s, it's simply not true. You can look around the world, you can see examples of stagflation, and you can argue for American exceptionalism. But that point, though, is that it shouldn't even be possible, according to the models that they still use and make policy decisions on. So, Pardon me, I'm getting on a bit of a rant here. What was the question? Yeah, well, it, it seems like we're having, we're going to have massive monetary inflation. Oh, is, right. Okay. So, so can that overcome, and can we still have the recession or, or stagflate? You know, right. So, I, d I don't know what will happen. Right. You know, my non-prediction attitude here. Is it possible that we get a more normal for recent decades, reflationary boom, right? Did they throw enough money at it? Which again, remember fiscal as well as monetary, you know, the Fed is loosening and they almost never just loosen once. It's just, it's a cycle, right? Right. So Fed is loosening. There's more easy money on that side, but even if they did nothing, even if they got crazy and, and listened to me and, and hyped rates or something, right? Right. You'd still have the other side of Washington, you know, the other end of the mall there, uh, turning out money left and right. And, and remember that we've now established as, can't call it legal precedent, but let's say governance precedent that no fault of their own is a sufficient reason to mail people, not just little condolence kisses, you know, but like multi-thousand dollar checks. And depending on the size of your small business, we're, we're, I'm not even just talking a couple thousand, like the stimmy checks were huge 
And they didn't just go to the banks and the fat cats on Wall Street. They went directly into people's pockets, which does affect consumer pricing and consumer behavior. So if we've now established that no fault of their own is sufficient and necessary you know, to send out the money helicopters, a recession is no fault of anybody's own. It actually might be, depending on who they voted for. But let's set that aside for the moment. You know, obviously, it's no fault of the poor people's own. We have this vicious uh, recession that came out of nowhere. So send out the money helicopters. In that case, sure, we could see bad news turn into good news on Wall Street. We could see, you know, skip the recession entirely. And, ooh, ooh, happy days. Of, you know, of course, the piper would have to be paid eventually for that party, too. The hangover cannot be put off forever. Um, but it might not work. You could do that, and you could actually scare people enough for them to say, holy, you know, for the, for this to be happening, you know, there must be something really bad. Now, you know, the people on the lower ends of the economic ladder, they're still going to spend that money. I'm not saying that, you know, or, or there will be more spending. But businesses, decisions that they're making, if they see the money helicopters fly without what seems like reasonable cause, then they could say, oh my gosh, actions speak louder than words. The government is telling us something really bad is happening. I'm not going to hire. I'm, I'm not going to expand. I'm not going to build that new factory or plant or something, right? So you could see it back. You could actually see very high inflation because of the money helicopters, but less business activity. I don't know which way it would go. Or you could see something in between. There are, there are a lot of different pathways here, but there are a couple of takeaways. One is, don't believe any pundits that tell you they know what's going to happen because there, there are all these different pathways. And the other is, you know, don't conflate different ideas. Like people often say, oh, you're in team hard landing. So, um, you know, that's deflationary. Well, not necessarily. Or they mm -hmm. say, there's going to be a hard landing. So what are you going to do when the markets crash? Well, not necessarily. Uh, uh, you know, a sudden economic shock can certainly make the markets crash. Or because the Fed has programmed investors for years now that bad news is good news, you could see markets take off on that. I mean, like what happened in 2020 was so insane. I mean, you know, who could have predicted that before it happened? Certainly not me. You see government lockdowns. You see people ordered to stay home. And okay, they're given money to spend. But still, you know, you see the government shutting down not just a city that's in quarantine or something, but the whole fucking country. Right. And yet, after an initial shock, the markets go to all time highs that very same time, not after the pandemic, not after everything opened up during the pandemic. We yeah. got all time highs. Yep. So I'm not here to rant about the craziness of all that, but I'm tempted. I'm here to say that it's not safe to assume that these different things are all of one. You, you know, the variables can come unglued. We are literally in uncharted waters. Any chart that you have, even from the 1970s, you know, is likely to lead you astray if you take it too literally. Yeah. Yeah, no, good answer. Speaking of which, I, I will rant a little. I was thinking about this just the other day, well, literally yesterday when I was driving down the road. I can't believe 2020 happened. The pinch me. Okay. Did that really happen? And I was watching people jogging on the sides of the sidewalk and uh, yeah, all of that. It's, it's really incredible. It reminds us, you know, we have these, we call it the veneer of civilization, the, the veneer of civilization, right? It's such a thin layer. We think we're civilized, but the caveman is still there. And when yeah. some really brutal, there's some big shock. I mean, so, so for example, you might, I don't want to get too political, but the the conflict in the Middle East right now, you know, you can say, well, this side is flaunting international law, that side is flaunting international law, yeah. you know, it, but the bottom line is, you know, when there's a massacre on either side, there's going to be a human reaction, whether it's legal, whether it's right, whether you could justify it, whether it violates anybody's rights and all this stuff. You know, as, as a libertarian, I have all my theories about rights and natural rights and how they work and initiation of the use of forests and all that, you know, all that basically goes out the window when you get these sort of tribal moments of, you know, the brown stuff hitting the fan and there's this gut reaction. And we saw that. There was so much stuff done in 2020 that was unconstitutional and nobody blinked. 
yeah. no, but almost nobody even asked questions. And it, yeah. As for stopping it, you know, not a chance of the snowball in the proverbial very hot place uh, yeah. being outside my house here in San Juan. <laughs> um, you know, so so yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not saying that right and wrong don't matter. I'm saying that in moments of historic acute pain for a society or a civilization, you know, bad stuff happens. And, and the, you, it's prudent to expect what would be human in such a case, not what's legal. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Let's talk about uranium. Um, and the reason why I talk about uranium, when I first talked to you, this was last springtime, um, you made this comment, hey, we're overheating. I'm paraphrasing. We're, it's overheated now. I would love to see a pullback. We might not get it. I'd like to see a pullback. A pullback's due. If we do, I'm going to buy more. Um, and now here we are. We've pulled back. A good part. I wouldn't. I would say it's significantly enough. We pulled back, and now it's no uranium is no longer in the headlines. There's your contrarian point of view, and it's boring. And boring's good. And I'm going on my own little rant. Most people, they don't buy when it's boring. Which is going to do, I yeah. guess. You're good for me and you. But yeah, what are your thoughts on uranium moving forward and where we're at? And yeah, what do you, what do you like? But this is why you try to be a contrarian. Momentum is a real thing in markets. Flavors of the day, you know, people piling in because something is making headlines. That The, the efficient market hypothesis, if you ask me, is a load of dingo's kidneys. Now, you know, it might be that the harnessing through the price system of millions of minds participating in a market does discover truths in the world that a single human could never do on his or her own. But, you know, to go from there to say that you'll never outsmart the market, I, I think it's just wrong. Anybody that does have the courage and strength, intellectual strength, to think for themselves and resist the herd mentality. You can outsmart the market. You can outsmart millions of minds that collectively completely overpower your CPU power up here simply by being contrarian. Because you know that the mass, the herd will occasionally stampede off a cliff or just go the wrong direction. And so the, the hubris here or the arrogance, if you want to call me that, is not that I think I'm smarter than anybody else. It's that I know that the mass will make mistakes. And if I discipline myself to separate myself from the investment herd enough that I can hopefully tell the difference between you know, a, a legitimate movement, a response to value versus something that's divorced from value, overpriced or under, you know, overbought, underbought. You know, there's, there's a profit going long as well as short. It can go either way. But the point is that markets overreact. They do get overbought. They do get oversold. That's why we have RSIs and things like that. And we're not imagining things. So, the, so no, you don't have to have a PhD or anything to, to do this. It's really about discipline. Uh -huh. One of my mottos, I have two big mottos. One is not mine, of course. It's caveat emptor because there's so much bullshit, you know, out there in the investment space and particularly in the mining space. Mark Twain's famous definition of a mine being a hole in the ground with a liar standing over it, right? So <laughs> caveat emptor is absolutely my favorite motto. But the other one is that discipline pays. And, you know, that that's a real thing. And, and you, know, you know, people want to get rich quick. And if you're looking for a get rich quick scheme, you know, I can't help you and beware of anybody who says they can. But if you're willing to do a little bit of work, um, then I think there is hope. Because the, the main variable here is not raw CPU power. You don't have to be Albert Einstein to do this. You just need to be disciplined enough to think independently. Got it. So yeah, there's more to it, but you know, there's the work too. But, but that's the key variable. That's the key distinguishing feature, I think, that makes the difference between successful speculators and you know gamblers who are sometimes riding high and sometimes weeping into their beers. Yeah. Got it. So that leads us back to uranium. Then you uh, might just be fierce. I'm really Mr. Distractions. No, oh, no, that's, uranium. That's, yes, today it is a contrarian. Yes, yes. Not quite as contrarian as it was in 22. I mean, 22 was just a gift, if you ask me. It was so hated. 
all they had to do was write, quote, the price of spot uranium on Twitter at the time. I think it was still Twitter back then. All I had to do was mention what the broker price index was that day, and I'd get a pile of hate. Oh, oh you're pumping this. You're doing that. I didn't say <laughs> bye. I just said, here's, you know, it's not like that now. I'm not getting anywhere near that level of hate. Um, but, but yeah, people are bored. Boredom is the next best thing to hate. If hate isn't going to happen, and honestly, I don't think we're going to get that much hate because the, the writing on the world here, on the wall here is just too obvious. The, the demand side, you know, it's like every week or two, we have some announcement out of China or India or somewhere of a raft of new reactors they're building or, you know, advanced reactors they're bringing online and things. And then the U.S. saying, oh, well, we, we can't be second place on that, right? You know? So, you know, the, the news on the demand side is just better and better and better. And it's so obvious. And then on top of that, now you have the climate change warriors jumping on board. Where, you know, like people who think we're all going to die in 11 years, or maybe it's 10 now, it's been a while since it was 12. Um, but anyway, if we're all going to die in, in a decade or so, uh, even nuclear power is, my, you know, even nuclear power might not be so bad if that can save us from all dying in, in 10 or 11 years. So, you know, the, the, they're, they're getting the memo there. Um, so I, it's just incredibly difficult to have, I think, in that context, people just giving up and jumping out of windows or, you know, throwing hate at the word uranium. You know, and we have a new villain. Coal is more evil than uranium now in this context. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very bullish. Supply, it remains constrained. We are seeing the, you know, the low-hanging fruit, the, the mines on care and maintenance coming back online and the e easier, cheaper products, uh, sorry, projects being built. That's, that's happening now. Um, and I understand there being some nervousness about that. But our estimate, our in-house estimate, is that even of all of these projects, the mothballed mines and the you know, the lower cost portile projects, even if they all come online, is not going to be enough. And then, so I'm, I'm just, I'm not worried about supply. And we're already seeing, you know, the world's largest and lowest cost producer has cut its guidance. It is producing more this year than last year, but it has cut its guidance from original intention for this year and for next year. And in fact, they're moving the goalposts. They are redefining their their agreements with the governments uh, so that they don't miss their targets, their production targets so much in the future. This is hugely bullish in my view. So maybe not hate, but boredom is good in this. And, and yes, uh, my most recent purchase was uranium. In a, in, sorry, not the metal, obviously a stock. Right, got it. Okay, last question. Is there any, uh, is there any other sector that's looking appealing to you? Obviously, again, Uranium, I I don't want to speak for you, but it sounds like that's your biggest, I don't want to say that's what you're most optimistic about, that in gold. Um, but yeah, any other sector that is look looks hated or boring that you like? Uh, okay, if we're going hated and boring, yes. I would say that right now, ahead of the recession and how, you know, how that plays out with multiple pathways, I'm not interested in any industrial minerals, not even oil. Um, you know, because because it always gets whacked going into a recession. Uh, so right now, my marching orders are uranium, gold, and silver. And silver, I'm actually people hate me for saying this. You know, it it is subject to industrial demand, and we have to see how that plays out. But silver has been behaving very nicely this year. It's been mirroring gold more than copper, which had been doing last year. So I'm 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 liking silver better near term than I had before. But I'm wow, do you more? Yeah, Darth Silver. People are saying Darth I killed Darth or not. But but I'm more comfortable with gold right now. Like gold, I have, you know, very little doubt how that plays out in the various re recession, you know, soft landing, stagflation, reflation, the various scenarios in front of us, basically all of them look bullish for gold for me, other than near term corrections. Silver, it depends. And you know, we'll we'll have to see how that goes. So I'm you know, that said, I actually see more upside in silver. Like if silver doesn't get held down and then later when the beach ball comes punching back up through the water, I actually see more upside in silver than in gold. But near term, you know, if I have a gold stock or a silver stock and they both look just as good and I could only buy one today, I'm buying the gold stock and the silver. Let me see how the recession goes. But back to the hate question, 
you know, people, especially gold bugs, love to hate electric cars. And I understand it. You know, they were shoved down our throat by the powers that be to, the, you know, the subsidies and mandates and all this stuff. I get it. I'm an anarchist. I don't like being pushed around any more than anybody else out there. But the fact remains that, you know, a lot of consumers, particularly the younger generations, want these products. You know, it's not just because of the mandates that they're happening. People want these cars. Um, and they're not, they're not just going away. And so the supply destruction that we're seeing on the lithium space is significant. You've got yeah. mines going on care and maintenance. You've got expansion not happening. You've got companies uh, looking at bankruptcy. And so, you know, lithium is not rare. I mean, it's right after hydrogen on the table of elements. Um, but production and refining capacity was limited and the price went nuts. And markets responded. High prices were the cure for high prices. And now we have pooling global economic activity. So prices are tanking. I can see, an, uh, I can see lithium coming back, even if, you know, the EV adoption rate is nothing like what the optimists want. I don't think it goes away. And even if, you know, we'll eventually have hydrogen cars or other technology in the future, I, I do think coming out of the recession, we're likely to see a rebound in lithium. So as far as like a hated thing, I like lithium for hate. Uh, nickel, not so much because in, in the usual time span of a recession, I think we'll see a lot more replacement of NCM batteries with LFP batteries, meaning the, the, um, the lithium batteries that don't have nickel, right? The iron phosphate ones were less efficient, less range, more concerned about that. But the latest generation of those have gotten much better. And there's more charging infrastructure going in. So I think there's less range anxiety than there was before. And so it's questionable to me, you know, whether the nickel batteries will come charging back after the recession. But, I, but either one has lithium. Mm -hmm. So in terms of hate. The other one, you know, oil, we, we still have plenty of hate around the world for oil. I'm not buying it now ahead of the recession, but after the recession, absolutely. Oil, lithium, after the recession, I'm still going to want to look, you know, what, what's the supply and demand in the market? You know, have, can those mothball mines come back online quickly? I, I want to check it out and see how it is. Whereas oil, it, to me, it's just like a no brainer. I, I won't have many questions. As soon as I'm sure the recession is done, it's worst then I'm going to be looking to buy the best oil and gas plays I can see on the market. Um, I would say the same of copper, but I don't see copper getting hated. So for your question for what's hated, copper doesn't work. If your question is what would I buy after I'm, I have an, an all clear to go on the industrial minerals and energy minerals besides uranium, mm -hmm. then the two absolute first would be oil and copper. Yeah. Next, I'd look at lithium, other things depend, you know, we might, not have enough graphite to put in the batteries. Other things might be possible, but the but the oil and gas, sorry, the oil and gas and the copper, maybe not gas, but oil and copper are the no-brainers. And then I'll be data dependent on the rest. Got it. Good answer. Lobo, um, people want to do business with you and uh, read your stuff. Where do they go and, and how do they follow you? Sure. You know, it happens to me often at conferences where somebody will come up with a spreadsheet and say, hey, this is my portfolio. What do you think? Can you tell me about this? Or I'm worried about this one. What do you think? And I cannot legally answer that question. I cannot give anybody financial advice on an individual basis. I can only publish my financial opinions via my publications. So if you've ever wanted somebody, to, you know, a due diligence guy to help you like that, you know, give you a second opinion, like, you know, another doctor, look over your shoulder there. We have a service called My Take which is like consumer reports and where, is, where I do that. It, there's no portfolio. It's not a typical newsletter. It's a database of company valuations. And I'm saying this, it's a paid product. I'm saying this because people just don't understand. People often, you know, they subscribe and they're like, oh my God, I had no idea. There's almost a thousand companies that you, and you can slice it and dice it, make lists of, you know, buying lists or selling lists, you know, all this sort of stuff. So that's one answer. If, if you, you, you want to hire me to be your due diligence guy, I can't do it one-on-one, -on -one, but I can help through my take. Before that, just there's a, there's a free newsletter called the Speculator's Digest. It's a weekly letter. You may or may not like the way I think and work, but that'll show you my mind. And the one thing I can promise about that is that if you sign up, we will not spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. I hate that. You get one email per week. 
decide whether or not, you know, I might, I might have the right stuff to be your due diligence guy. Excellent. Lobo, I want to uh, thank you so much. It's been great getting to know you over the past year. Um, I've always been a fan of your work and yeah, it's great being getting to know you and seeing you, uh, not only in zoom, but in person. So thank you for that. And, uh, yeah, all the best. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Andy. Until next time. Yeah, absolutely.